What do you do when you've bought your mother a welder, knowing full well she doesn't know how to weld, and then you recently find out she's discovered your YouTube channel? Well, you die of embarrassment and you make a video about it. Now I'm going to start this video with absolute transparency. I am not a tradesman welder, although I have received some training in my mechanical fitters apprenticeship. And I'm under no illusions that I'm an expert welder. So today, we're going to be focusing on MIG welding. Now there are other types, such as TIG and this one. Now MIG means metal and inert gas, which means you're welding using metal and inert gas. The clue is in the name. TIG stands for tungsten and inert gas, which means that you're using a tungsten electrode. And the last one is arc welding, or stick welding to the common man. Now, if you've seen any welding, you'll be familiar with this machine. Now, this is the one I use on an almost daily basis, which is why most of my clothes look like they've been eaten by moths. But I'm not going to be using that today. I'm going to be focusing on an entry-level one that's very easy to start with, that uses gasless wire, which obviously doesn't require its own gas. It's just a baby. Now this is a welder that I bought when I didn't have a dollar to my name, and I was extremely skeptical about it considering all the other welding machines I'd used previously were similar to this one. However, I was actually really surprised with how good it was, so I'd actually recommend it quite a lot. Now going back to welding, what is welding? Well, it's basically sticking two bits of metal together by adding other melted metal, and that's about it. And it's actually very easy to get usable results from a welder, but very difficult to get perfect ones like you see from an actual trade. So in the most basic sense, what you're doing with welding is turning metal into liquid and guiding the flow of the liquid to where you want it to go. And then obviously once you stop applying the heat, it becomes regular metal again. And welding is also comparable to painting. It's very important to prep everything properly. Try saying that five times fast. So we'll start with step one, preparation. Now this is a few pieces of right angled section made out of mild steel that I've just chopped up from the scrap bin. And that's what we're gonna be using today. As you can see, it's pretty rusty and there's nothing that stands out about it. Apart from the cut ends, there are no extra features. Now while there are lots of types of weld, we're gonna focus on two of them today. And that's a V weld and a butt weld. So let's say we're welding along this edge here a butt weld is simply joining two pieces of metal together by butting them up against each other, hence the name butt weld. And a V-weld, as the name suggests, is doing the same thing, but the end result is a V-shape. So you would be welding in a gutter. Now going back to what we talked about with pretending that we're talking about the flow of a liquid, which we are, we need to prepare the metal so the metal will actually flow in the direction we want it to. So we'll start with a butt weld. As you can see, this surface is pretty flat. If we pour water on this, it's just gonna go everywhere. However, if we chamfer these edges, we can make a little channel that the metal will flow down. So as if by magic, that's going to happen. And there you have it. There's now a chamfer running along these edges. Admittedly, it would work better on a thicker material, but the chamfer here, in this case, has taken up the entire thickness of the material. But when you butt them together, there's a channel that all the liquid metal is gonna run down, which is gonna give you a much nicer weld. And in this case, with the V-weld, when you put the material together, it already creates its own channel. So in this case, I probably am not gonna do any preparation, apart from removing the surface layer. Because what this does is it removes any oxidization that you might find on the material. And again, it'll give you a clean surface to weld to. 
because what you'll find is any impurities in the metal are going to cause you problems. And this can be anything from air bubbles in the weld to inconsistent penetration. Penetration? That doesn't sound like a welding term. Well, to understand this one, we will talk about the welder's controls. Now, as this is a very basic welder, it's only really got two controls on it. It's able to do arc welding as well as MIG welding, but obviously we don't have the arc welder attachment fitted. And the two controls are wire speed and voltage or amperage. And there's this switch at the top that switches between MIG and MMA. MMA is arc welding, not what you think. But we're doing MIG welding, so up it goes. Now moving on to the torch side, this is the bit that makes the welding happen. Now typically in a gas welder, you'd have an, a gas line hooked up to the inside of this, which will provide cover for the shielding gas, which prevents any oxidization during welding. But in this case, we're using a special wire, which is flux cord. And what this means is that as the metal melts, it burns a substance which creates an inert gas that negates the need for any gas. So essentially, this is a core within a core. The steel wire runs through the middle of the handle and then comes out at the end, and then the wire itself has its own core similarly to Harry Potter's wand. But how did the wire get there? Now inside the welder, you have a very baby spool of wire, which is what we just talked about. And on the other side, that wire is rooted down here. And this wire goes then all the way down through the tube and out into the handle like we just saw. Now it has a clamp here, this is to put tension on the cable to allow the motor to feed it through. And when this turns, it forces the wire through. So when you pull the trigger, it comes out. And especially with gasless welding like we're doing today, the tension on this wire is extremely important. Because as you know now, it's got a cord wire. It means if you add too much pressure on this wheel here, you'll crush the wire and ruin the flux core. So a suggested method, whether it's industry standard or not, is to back this tensioner off all the way, hold down the trigger on this when it's switched on, and tighten it until the wire comes out with enough force for you to push it back against the surface. And if you can do that, it's tight enough. What you don't want is the wire to come out with such a force that it'll fold itself over and cause itself some nasty business. But it's not exactly a precise art, so do it generally. Now going back to the controls and penetration, we talked about having a wire feed and an amperage control. And you can think of it this way. The wire speed is self-explanatory. The faster you turn it, the faster the wire comes out. And this dial controls how fast the metal melts. And you need to find a balance between the wire coming out and melting. And then you'd scale these up depending on how thick the material is you're using. So let's say you're using a very thin material. You'd need low amperage so that you don't melt all the way through the material. And then you'd have to adjust your wire speed so that the amount of wire coming out is able to melt in time with the amperage. And it's very horrible to understand words, so let's look at it in practice. Now as we're working with electricity, electricity needs a way in and a way out. Now the way in is through the gun. And the way out is through your earthing line. And you can put this pretty much wherever you want as long as it's in contact with the material. So you can either connect it to the material, but what I'm opting to do is connect it to my metal desk and then clamp the material down. So I'll just prep this surface and carry on. So that's the surface prepped. It's all down to bare metal, and I can clamp on that and give it a good contact for the earth. Now setting up this style of welder is a bit of a trial and error exercise, but you can get semi-accurate results by considering the maximum thickness that this can deal with. And in this case, I believe it's six millimeters of steel, which means that if you set your amps to the max, you should expect to deal with six mil. And this is relative. So you can turn the knob halfway to deal with three millimeters and then you can fine tune your wire feed. Now another thing to consider is getting a good mask. Even though this isn't the best in the market, it's still an auto dimming function, which I think they all should be. 
The traditional style ones I think are absolutely useless because you can't see what you're doing until you actually start welding. And this is obviously to protect your eyes because welding gives off all kinds of horrible radiation which can essentially give your eyes very bad sunburn. Ask me how I know. So with the basics out of the way, your material prepped, clamped and earthed, we can find out what bad welding looks like. Now the first weld I'm going to do is to demonstrate what it looks like when your voltage is set too low. And what I'm expecting is for the weld to just sit on top of the material. And this is bad because it doesn't really melt into the material and you're just left with a very brittle blob that could snap off and isn't really going to hold anything together. So let's see what that looks like. Now unfortunately I'm going to keep the camera lens a good distance away from this and use the zoom function. So you're probably not going to see that much detail of the welding itself. Anyway, let's begin. Now the first thing you'll notice is all this white residue. And that's pretty normal. This is what happens when you're using gasless MIG. Whereas if you're using gas welding, this doesn't occur as much. But you can just clean it off with a wire brush. And what this is, is crap weld number one. This is not enough penetration, although the wire feed is probably okay. And what you can see is the weld is just sitting on the surface, not really doing anything else. I'm sure if I've got a chisel, I could just break that off. Now from here, you can adjust your settings. So if you see something like that, obviously you need more amps. And the sound you're looking for is a constant sizzling sound. So if it sounds like it's chugging, it means that your wire speed is either too high or too low. So let's look at what happens when the wire speed is too high. Now the main difference you're going to notice is the amount of splatter that's there. As you can see, there's hardly any when the wire is set correctly, but the amperage isn't. But if the wire speed is too high, there's all this extra metal that's being melted and thrown around and giving you another horrible result. So there are two options in this case. You can either reduce the wire speed or increase the amperage. And in this case, we're going to increase the amperage to get more penetration into the metal and see how that goes. So the last bit is what you get with a little bit of dialing in. What I don't want to do is show you what happens when the wire speed is too low because what it tends to do is block up the nozzle because the molten metal will actually go back inside and then you have to strip the whole gun down to clear it. Now this is unfortunately the best I can do for now. The problem with this welder is it's about seven years old and it's very heavily used, probably more than they actually designed it to be used. And I'm slowly beginning to remember the reasons why I replaced it. Now what I'm finding is as the wire is being fed out, it's coming out sporadically, which is resulting in all these lumps. However, the amperage seems to give okay penetration around here. But if you're using one of these welders that's in better condition, I'm sure you'll have much better results than this. So if you cast your mind back to a few minutes ago, you'll remember that we prepared this. And now I'm going to try and attempt to weld it at an awkward angle to try and give a good camera angle and then blame that reason on the reason why it's a crap weld. And what we have here is the end result. Now gasless MIG, by definition, is always going to be inherently splattery. But I'm not making excuses. I'm not a very good welder. Now you can get some anti-splatter spray that you put on the material before you weld on it, and that helps reduce this. What it means is that the material will just ball up, and then you can just wipe it off afterwards. But if you compare this to what we had before, you can see that the weld is sitting nicely in that little recess, and it looks relatively flat. Now what you can see as I'm moving the welder down is it's sort of pulsing a little bit. And this is what I was mentioning before with the inconsistent wire feed. But anyway, if you're a beginner, this is what you could probably expect to get out of a gasless MIG welder. Let alone one that's in crap condition like this one. Anyway, V-welds. They're a little bit easier. Now this one could turn out to be a little bit more awkward. I'm trying to weld down this gap here. I've cleaned up my surfaces, but access isn't going to be the easiest thing in the world. Because what the ideal situation is, is that you tackle it at a 45 degree angle and let gravity help you out in the process. 
But in this case, I'm not quite there. Okay, so I give up on this. This welder is absolute crap. But here's one I made earlier. This is a V-weld. Again, not a perfect one, but much better than we're going to see with this. You can see there's no real spatter with it. Probably could do with a bit more penetration, but that's it. This is a V-weld. Moving on. So what have we learned from this escapade? Well, firstly, gasless MIG welding creates a lot of smoke, and it gets on everything. So you basically need windscreen wipers if you're using a helmet. Secondly, you should never forget why you replaced your machinery. And thirdly, you should never learn how to weld by watching YouTube videos.